All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this English Australia webinar. Um, it's entitled Tech Squad and it's with Anthony Tibbs. Um, my name is Heno Katsia. I'm the convener of the English Australia Special Interest Group for Educational Technology. And um, we're very happy to bring you this webinar today. Um, so Anthony has taught in, is taught English in the UK, in Russia, in Georgia and Australia. He completed his master's degree uh, in Applied Linguistics in Mel at Melbourne University in 2017, where he specialized in language learning and technology. He has a particular interest in feedback and learning design, and, and he works as an e-learning specialist at Monash College at the moment. Uh, his session that he's going to bring to you today is called Tech Squad. I first saw this uh, earlier this year at the English Australia National Conference in Melbourne, and uh, I thought it was a fantastic session. So I hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, um, Anthony Tibbs. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. So welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along to this webinar. So. I mentioned this is a presentation that I gave at the English Australia conference earlier this year. So it has a very long wordy subtitle there, but basically Tech Squad is the working title for the uh, framework that I'm going to be talking about today. So basically Tech Squad is the name for uh, a specialized community of practice where teachers trial the same technology and uh, in the classroom. And then at the end of the uh, trial, they get together and make a vote on whether they recommend um, to continue using the technology. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, so I had the idea back in 2017 and we had the first tech squads um, in early 2018. There's been four iterations and there's a fifth happening uh, at the moment. And uh, so the initial idea went through a lot of development. So it went through, was really refined and worked on in collaboration with colleagues uh, here at the college. So I'd like to give you a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So just to situate the motivation for Tech Squad, I'm going to briefly touch on some of the challenges in technology enhanced learning that, um, in particular, teachers face. Uh, in my opinion and what I've experienced. Um, then I'll talk a bit about Tech Squad as part of the solution. So in order to do that, I wanted to tell the story of the first two Tech Squads that we have. Um, to give you some more detail about uh, what we tried, uh, what we learned, and how we uh, adapted the process. Um, then I'll move on to some of the considerations for setting up a Tech Squad or something like a Tech Squad if you were to do one uh, in your context, in your school or your institution. Um, I'll wrap up with uh, a little bit more detail about the process and some of the key steps that you need to cover off on um, in the Tech Squad, and uh, then some of the benefits that we've experienced here at Monash College from running Tech Squads. Okay, so before I start talking, I'd like to put a question out to everyone uh, in the audience. So I'm just looking for some examples. Uh, what challenges do teachers currently face with regards to using technology for teaching and learning? Uh, share a few um, examples. It could be specific to uh, where you work or you teach, or it could be things that you've noticed more broadly. Just give you a minute or two to type in some uh, answers. So someone said um, not being confident to use new platforms or apps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> someone else has said um, time to trial and then refine and share. <clears throat> not being interested. Frustration when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. Keeping up with changes privacy, student data security. Hmm. How to well, apply fine. technology that's not just at a gimmick level, but helps students to actually learn language? 
Mm -hmm. And a few people have um, mentioned the updated browsers on an institutional level can be an issue as well. Great. Well, I think that's that's a really fantastic set of examples, actually, covering off on a really a big range of, of topics and issues. Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Sophie. If there's any other good examples, maybe we can circle back. But um, so I might move on now to talk about some of the challenges that we have at Monash College, but also in um, more generally. So definitely some of the things that were mentioned by the audience today are in this list. So definitely anxiety around technology. Uh, so oh, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback. Is everything uh, audio okay? Um, it sounds clear to me. Okay, great. All right, I will continue. Sorry about that. So yeah, definitely anxiety around technology. I think we've all been in a situation where things haven't gone quite right, or also anxiety maybe around privacy and security issues. Definitely keeping up, constant changes in software. Um, and I liked the uh, comments there about uh, not using technology in a gimmicky way, but one that actually facilitates and helps students learn language. So I think that touches on my third point here, which is like, how do you actually use a new tool in the classroom? And when I say that, I mean in terms of actually getting uh, the best leverage out of it um, for to help your students learn, basically. Um, also, institutional implementation of platforms. That's definitely something that was mentioned a bit there. And I think um, this, for me, it depends on the scale of the institution as well. But say, uh, Ellicos, a university, um, universities often have an LMS that's um, instituted. And this will mean that teachers are often spend a lot of their time um, going through training and how to use that required platform. And also, they might spend a lot of their bandwidth that they have for um, trialing out new things in technology on just keeping up with that particular platform. Um, and also, part of that means that teachers can also feel a bit reliant on e-learning experts. So not that there's anything wrong with them because I am definitely one of, <laughs> one of those people at the moment, although I have a background in teaching and I still think of myself as a teacher. Um, uh, yeah, but basically it can mean that their uh, teachers are um, really needing that training from other people or a lot of extra support for how to use technology. And then they might not feel that they're really at the cutting edge or really developing new, new things there. Um, also, there's a point that my second last point there is about around lock-in. So basically, lock-in is the idea that once, um, say, an institution or a school or a company commits to using a tech, some technology and they, then they actually invest a lot in it, then it can be so expensive to switch away from that technology when something new or maybe better comes along that it doesn't happen. You know, it takes to it'll be too expensive, too much time, and so on. Um, so this can really this can stifle progress and innovation. And I think that it really comes together in uh, this final point that basically it can result in teachers basically using what is available rather than what's influencing what new ed tech tools are being made. And really, um, I think this is much broader in terms of how we can push pedagogy forward using technology um, and definitely come away from that idea of just using uh, the latest shiny tool that uh, might be a bit gimmicky. Um, yeah. So wanted to pull in a quote from Diana Lorillard, who uh, really uh, resonate a lot with her thinking around this uh, idea with teachers and technology. And she talks a lot about uh, the disruptive nature of digital technology, like uh, LMSs or computers and so on, uh, and software in particular. And she says, precisely because of digital technology's potential to change education unbidden, it is imperative that teachers and lecturers place themselves in a position where they are able to master the use of them, to harness their power and put them to the proper service of education. So I really think that this is um, something that uh, really will have a lot of benefits for teachers and for students as well, if we can have teachers in this position where they're um, not only uh, using software uh, that other people have developed, or maybe people who are not educators, they're actually at the forefront um, helping shape what kind of software gets developed. But maybe this is sort of the long term. And Tech Squad really, uh, if we bring it back, Tech Squad is looking at the situation now and how we can start to take steps towards this. So 
I'd like to talk about the Tech Squad framework. So basically, it, it's based on the idea of a community of practice. So this is where a group of teachers who are interested in the same area collaborate together to investigate that area and share best practice. So in this case, it's really focused on um, e-learning or using uh, different technology and software in the classroom. So with Tech Squad, we take that uh, collaborative um, approach and it's married together with a particular process. So this means that it has a start and an end point that all the teachers are actually trialing a particular tool. And when I say tool, it's typically a piece of software. Uh, we'll see some examples of that um, in the next two Tech Squad uh, stories that I'll tell. Um, teachers will meet once at the beginning face-to-face -face and once at the end. Um, and the final product or outcome is a recommendation that the teachers um, provide about that technology. And it's based on their experience using it and also data that they collect. So to illustrate a little bit more, I'd like to tell the story of uh, the first two tech squads. So the first one, uh, we trialed a tool called Doctopus which in fact is, uh, it's an add-on for Google Sheets. And the reason that we picked this tool as something to try is that uh, we have G Suite, uh, like Google Tools, Google Docs, and so on at Monash College. And, uh, and it, their teachers were using this quite a lot, Google Docs with their students, but they uh, needed some, uh, basically Doctopus had some uh, functionality around sharing files, getting some extra data and so on, that it looked like it had potential for helping teachers with some of the pain points around file management in, um, in Google Drive. Uh, but basically, uh, there were two main issues that we had with Tech Squad 1, with the Doctopus 1. So the first one was actually the tool selection. So one of the issues with the tool selection was that uh, Doctopus is not really a lesson. It's not really something you can run a lesson on, although there's some ways you can use it. It's really about um, file management and um, you know, uh, communication with your students. Um, the other problem is it's uh, very complicated uh, as well. And basically, we'll see some of the feedback from the teachers at the end. But um, the other issue we had was the kickoff meetings. So basically, Tech Squad really since its beginning has always been uh, a sort of extracurricular, extra activity that teachers were, have been participating in. So it's something they do in addition to their normal duties as teachers. So really there was a strong emphasis on making it very lightweight so that the requirements from teachers would be um, as small as possible. So part of this was um, to make the kickoff meeting at the very beginning of the tech squad as short as possible, which was, um, I think we had it 30 minutes for the first one. And unfortunately this was just impossible to achieve what needed to be done in that kickoff meeting in the first one. The other thing was that Tech Squad, when I initially pitched the idea to teachers, I was expecting a handful of people to sign up, and then we had about 16, which was, I think, more than half of the deployed staff on that um, program. So it was a huge number of teachers with a very wide range of technical skills. So I couldn't help myself. I put together a PD for them. As you can see, these slides, no doubt, very helpful. But I put a lot of my effort in getting the kickoff meeting ready uh, and invested in getting these slides together. So really, we had a couple of different um, effects of this. So basically, it might be a little small, but basically, there were zero votes for <laughs> Dr. Puss at the end. Uh, basically, because of some of the things I mentioned around it being very complex, um, it was too complicated. It had some very clever things done with sharing folders and nesting folders that basically meant that it was very easy for things to go wrong. Um, so they did have a couple of things they liked about it, but really overwhelmingly the teachers did not like it. For example, one, one teacher uh, accidentally sent a spam message to all the managers and from managers down uh, in Wash College, which he was quite um, embarrassed about, not his fault actually, but, um, you know, these are some of the risks that you have. So he put it down as very scary. Um, so basically, this actually meant that teachers decided very early on in the tech squad, well before it finished, that they didn't like it. So there was not very much communication and sharing and trialing that happened during the period because teachers really made up their mind very quickly. But we did see it out, teachers did trial it. Um, and in the meeting at the end, although they didn't like Doctopus and it was an overwhelming, nope, we don't recommend it for use here. Um, Actually, they really enjoyed the process of Tech Squad and they wanted to do another one. So that's how we led into Tech Squad 2. So in Tech Squad 2, 
Um, the main changes were around those two issues that we had in the first place, which was tool selection and the kickoff meeting. So in terms of tool selection, we went for VR. You can see here in the photo, the Motley collection of VR viewers, like Google Cardboard um, style ones that we put, pulled together from various sources for our trial. Um, but basically VR was a better candidate because um, it was getting a lot of hype uh, and it still is, still does get a bit of hype. It's kind of trailing off a little bit now, but um, it also doesn't was not in use at all in our context. So nobody was using VR for English language learning at Monash College. There's also, because it's fairly new, there was no sort of established patterns about how to use it. How, what kind of lessons should you run with this technology? What's the best way to use it? So it really was a prime candidate for exploration. And I also thought we need something that's a bit more of a winner. So I thought VR was more exciting. <laughs> that was the uh, subtext for picking this one as well. So the, in terms of the kickoff meeting, I completely revamped the approach to this. So there was, it was not a PD uh, and it was much longer. So it was actually, we um, had an hour and it was the first part was that it was very hands-on. We played around with the technology and then we broke out into groups and we had lots of different uh, things to brainstorm and discuss. So here's actually a photograph of the whiteboard from one of the kickoff meetings. As you can see, quite different to the slideshow, the Polish slideshow presentation from the first one. Uh, we talked, we were actually um, thinking about just using Google Expeditions, which is a particular app you can use with Cardboard at that time. So there was a very brief um, two minute explainer involving these doodles about, you know, the VR viewers, the phone and so on. Uh, and then we jumped straight into actually using the VR headsets and the apps. So different teachers had go at kind of um, running a lesson while we were going, we were chatting about it, then we broke into groups. Um, and teachers were thinking first about what kind of lesson ideas. So we tried out the VR headsets. Okay, well, how could we use this? What are some things we could come up with? Teachers brainstormed a lot of ideas. Then um, the groups then discussed questions they had about using the VR and also any concerns they had. So then you can see on the left-hand side, this is the results of the discussion. So basically, um, we had a lot of really um, interesting questions really focused on pedagogy and so on. So one of the questions were, well, what about English development? Um, you know, is there an advantage of the engagement through immersion or is, is it worth the setup? Because, you know, you've got to bring in these viewers and get apps on your phone, all kinds of stuff. Um, and also some very practical things like how long should the lesson be? Where should it come? Uh, and in terms of concerns, you know, we talked about uh, all kinds of things like dodgy content. You know, if you're using 360 videos on YouTube, one teacher had said she'd played around. She actually donated one of the VR headsets for the set for the um, trial. And she said, well, you know, when I was playing around, sometimes you get some really weird stuff on YouTube that is 360 video content. So also um, we talked about sort of the student perception of the relevance to their English development. So there's really um, quite a broad range of things that teachers were coming up with from pedagogical to technical to um, student perception and so on. And then we looked at um, altogether brainstorming some solutions for some of the risks, you know, so coming up with alternative options uh, and so on. So really the kickoff meeting was a completely different and the ensuing tech squad for tech squad two was quite different as a result as well. So first of all, um, because it was more lesson based, the teachers were trialing VR through the whole duration of the five week term that we were trialing VR. There was a lot of um, communication on various different modes. We had teachers collaborating face to face. We had a shared folder in Google Drive. I've got a screenshot here on the right. Um, chatting on Hangouts via email. Um, also teachers were sharing their lesson plans and samples of student work, uh, sharing their experience. So if they ran VR with their students, they would immediately um, share how it went with the group. So, you know, if there's any pitfalls or things to avoid, they were sharing it as we went along. Also getting feedback and data from students. So on the right hand side, I mean, there's um, lessons, there's images. Um, one, one teacher got permission from her students to take photos of them using it and so on. So we had all kinds of really great sharing. So the other thing, for example, with the lesson plans is we had teachers, one teacher would come up with a lesson plan and then that same lesson plan would be trialed by a couple of other teachers in the squad. So it got used in a few different classes, it got refined. So that was really um, exciting to see. Uh, also in the wrap up meeting, actually we had very mixed results about VR. So some teachers thought it was very positive. Other teachers had students were more ambivalent. Um, so really there wasn't a clear recommendation. So we basically decided let's run another textbook on VR to collect more data. So textbook three was again VR. Um, and so actually we more or less ran with the same um, 
process. We had a tiny bit of change in membership. Some teachers um, dropped out, some new teachers joined in. And uh, at the very end of Tech Squad 3, to fast forward, we actually um, voted that we do recommend VR for use, but with caveats. And these caveats were based out of teachers' experience about the kind of times when it was good to use VR in the course, the kind of, uh, so for example, after the exam period, when, when uh, sort of we have our exams, and then after that, it's a great time to do something really exciting and engaging um, that students could get into with one recommendation, the kind of length of time of the actual lesson you would run, and so on. So, from Tech Squad 2, we also had quite a lot of other outputs that I want to briefly cover off here. So one of the things we did was we actually shared our findings in an article that was written collaboratively by seven different teachers who participated in the Tech Squad. This article shared their experiences, some of their students' feedback, and so on. You can see a picture that the, one of the teachers took there. Um, and this was shared on our college-wide intranet, so not only with our English Language Center, but with our foundation year and diplomas and so on. So it, um, was shared quite widely within the college. We also, um, had, I wanted to look at these teacher reflections because I think it um, speaks a little bit to what the uh, kind of the feeling the teachers had and what they got out of it. So I'll just read them out loud here. So when I decided to try VR headsets, I was quite nervous as I knew that my students were much better at using technology than me. I was mainly worried that what was novelty to me might just be an ordinary thing for them. I was very pleased to see excitement on their faces when I brought VR headsets to the classroom. I could even sense a thrill of anticipation that I, when I told them that we use these headsets for learning English. And a different teacher said, the process of experimenting with new technology in the classroom was fun and opened up new possibilities that as a teacher, you could enhance students' experience and understanding more deeply about a place and appreciate the perspective of someone by seeing what they see and then speaking about it. So this teacher, I think, had run a lesson where they watched um, I think it was around global warming. They found these uh, fantastic um, videos with really high production value around forest fires and other kinds of things. And so their lesson was based on uh, really experiencing the effects of um, climate change or global warming, and then um, actually doing some activities out of that experience. So really, um, really great feedback. We also had a lot of lesson plans. So this is a lesson plan for um, pre-intermediate. So actually this is a lesson plan that um, myself and a colleague uh, collaborated on and we team taught this lesson together. So this lesson is now in the teacher created resources and available for any teachers to use. And it was um, refined through actual, through being used in the classroom. We also had, um, so we also had basically a class set of VR viewers. So we replaced that um, collection of loaned uh, VR viewers with a full set of the same design, these ones here for um, 18 of them. These are now available for any teacher to loan from the Library and Learning Center um, to use with their students. So this was a matter of going to um, going to the center and explaining our findings and our results and passing our recommendation on. And we got, it was really fantastic. We had the support that they um, purchased a set of viewers. So that was really great. And they're still being used. I, I've heard of some of them are breaking, which is, uh, I guess, good. <laughs> it shows that they're being used, but um, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, too much? I don't know. Okay. So basically, I hope that that story of Tech Squad 1 and 2 gives you a sense of the kind of thing that um, happens in the process. So now I'd like to circle back to Tech Squad and the process and just talk about some things that you'll need to keep in mind, say, if you were to run something similar in your own context. So these considerations were things that uh, we went through at Monash College. Uh, we're quite a large center. So some of these things may or may not be applicable to your center, but definitely something to consider. So first of all, after having the idea, it was a matter of getting necessary approvals for running the tech squad. And really a lot of that was around clarifying the expectations of teachers who are gonna participate. So what would the workload be? Um, how much time would it take? What about priorities in terms of um, their regular teaching duties and so on? Then another thing to consider is who's going to facilitate? Because actually, Although in Tech Squad it's a community of practice and um, really the uh, findings and the data and all the, th the activity of the Tech Squad happens with the teachers, the, you do need a facilitator to basically make sure that, you know, who's going to arrange the first meeting, um, who's going to arrange the last meeting, keep the communication going throughout. So really you need a facilitator. So at Monash College we're lucky to have um, uh, a role called e-learning coordinator, which uh, part of their job is supporting teachers with um, 
blended learning and e-learning skills. So at Monash College, the um, e-learning coordinator has mostly been the facilitator, but really it's just a bit of logistics actually. Um, but yeah, something to consider. I don't see why, any reason why uh, at a smaller place, uh, teachers could facilitate as well, for sure. We also have some policies and procedures at Monash College that needed to be considered. So we have a social media policy. So any tool that we consider for Tech Squad, really we need to make sure that if it comes under the um, aegis of this social media policy that we are compliant. So that means that um, we're looking at what happens to student data, we're looking at um, whether any personal information is shared more broadly on the internet and that kind of thing. So, um, and another key requirement is that the teacher is the administrator of any group. And then when the class is finished, the teacher then closes the group after that, for example. So we also have e-learning governance policy, which really um, controls uh, or it really covers off on the different um, uh, technology that is um, supported officially by our central e-learning team. So that includes for us Moodle and things like that, our LMS, um, but there also, um, stipulates that teachers are um, allowed to trial any other technology they like uh, with students in the classroom. So they're allowed to try other new apps that aren't officially supported, but they do take on any risk for doing that. So really, this is something that um, we always highlight in the first kickoff meeting, really, that, um, that basically, and also why that's one of the questions is really around any concerns, because you're trying to anticipate any kind of risks that you might have and then being prepared to head them off, which is, I think, not only best practice, but it also makes sure that we're, um, teachers are aware of this element from the governance policy. Okay, so let's actually look at the process of Tech Squad. So really, there's kind of five key steps. Um, and these key steps really, from following these steps, you get a lot of the benefits out of them and missing any of the steps and you'll miss on some of the key benefits as well. So I just wanted to go through this um, uh, step by step. So the first step um, is tool selection. So really um, this happens before the text board kicks off and you're looking for a tool that meets particular criteria, which means that it's something that shows potential, has some kind of potential for your context and it's not already in use in your context as well. So for example, Tech Squad 4, we trialed Flipgrid, which is a really, um, it's a great platform for sharing videos uh, where students can post videos and respond and that kind of thing. Um, and this is very popular in K-12 in the US, but it's not, it was not in use in Monash College and it's not quite as popular as far as I can see in, in Australia. So uh, then also you need to do a safety check, which is looking at the privacy policy, what they do with student data. And that can mean actually really looking at the tool, looking at those different things, sometimes emailing the um, emailing them if there's something that you're not clear about. Uh, so yeah, really making sure that there's nothing uh, that could cause a problem. Once you picked a tool um, and teachers have agreed that, that they are excited to try it, then you have you arrange the kickoff meeting, which really, as we saw in the example for Tech Squad 2, you want to make sure that you have some hands-on practice with the tool. Um, by running some kind of sort of mini lesson activity. So, you know, with uh, Flipgrid, they created a space and people had fun contributing videos and they play around with it. Then out of that, you look at any questions you have, sort of almost like research questions, like what are some things you want to investigate to give a kind of purpose for, um, or direction to the investigation from for teachers during the squad. Also looking at concerns or risks, uh, potential solutions for those, and also lesson ideas. And actually, at this point, um, it's worth saying that the lesson ideas are not really going to be the best. It's just really starting to brainstorm that idea, because actually with VR, all of the lesson ideas that we came up with in our kickoff meeting, um, in fact, the best VR lessons were none of them were actually on that board in the beginning. But really, it's just about getting getting the ideas going. Um, then you have the trial period. So this is flexible. We've actually had two different trial periods at Monash College. We've had five weeks, which matches one of our five week terms. And we've also had 10 weeks as well that covers two terms. Um, and during this trial period, really the expectation for teachers or participants is that they plan and deliver at least one lesson. And it could be they actually borrow a lesson that someone else planned. They actually deliver one lesson and collect some data. Uh, and also that they collaborate and share updates as they go. So if they come across any speed bumps, they can give advance warning to other um, participants. So um, then you come to the end of the uh, trial period and you have your wrap up meeting. So this is really quite informal. Um, it's a bit, sh quite a bit shorter in my experience in the kickoff meeting. You're just sort of uh, sharing experience and data. We've actually um, done this over drinks 
at the end of the term. So you just chat about how it went. Teachers would um, discuss some of the data they collected in terms of student feedback or um, pieces of writing maybe. Uh, we're reflecting, discussing together, and then really you wanna make sure you get a vote. So um, teachers, uh, you know, we do thumbs up, thumbs down. Do we recommend for continued use in our context? Um, and then finally, it's really important to share your findings. So this could be a PD session, so, or an article like you saw. So um, with Flipgrid, there's a PD session um, planned to share teachers, uh, because Flipgrid, spoiler, I think we did recommend it. Um, so we're, the teachers, some of the teachers in the tech squad are gonna run a PD session for other teachers around the college about how to use it. Um, but also uh, an article, but basically just sharing your results. So that's sharing with your colleagues, but also sharing with your institution and so on. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the process, as you can see. Um, and I also just wanted to put this slide in here as a bit of reference, because I think for me, the kickoff meeting is absolutely the most crucial point, um, because it really sets up the entire uh, tech squad, the whole process. So if you run it like a PD, like we did, or like I did, couldn't help myself, like I did in the first one, then really um, you don't get the same uh, results during the squad. You know, getting hands-on practice, brainstorming ideas, and really it sets up that collaborative, that inquiry-based approach, and really um, gets teachers asking important questions before we even start. Um, so it's really, uh, yeah, it's really important to include these ingredients in any kickoff meeting. Right. So that. The tech squad framework, really, it's very flexible, it's simple, it's inexpensive. Um, you know, we haven't, we did uh, buy VR viewers at the end, but all of the trials have been, we've been using free versions or trial versions, so it doesn't cost the center any money, for example, it's something that um, uh, might be a concern in some contexts. But it's, it's also very um, simple, it really, because it's based on a natural process of experimentation and innovation, really, you know, you see something that looks kind of cool, you try it out, run a lesson or two, then maybe you might tell your colleague, yeah, yeah, this is good, you should try it. So really it's just taking that natural process and amplifying it through collaboration. Uh, and really it can, it works well at places like Monash College that are very big, and I'm confident it would work better at smaller schools, um, the kind of schools I, I've worked at in the past as well, I can definitely see it working there. And really it can be facilitated by teachers or tech coaches. When I say tech coach, I mean something like an e-learning coordinator. There's different kinds of um, roles with this broad title uh, that really depends on your context. But basically, if, you're, if you kind of miss any of the steps in the process, you'll really miss out on some of the benefits. So say if you um, don't really encourage teachers to be collaborating um, and sharing and communicating during the trial period. If it's 10 weeks long, you know, you're going to really miss out on some of that sharing that you could that you could get. But uh, equally, if you don't, um, at the end of the tech squad process, if you don't actually share your findings, then really you're not, um, then it, you're losing the benefits of actually this, um, this sort of research project you've done, more or less, you know, this experience you've gotten, and you really want to be sharing that with the wider community. So. Um, yeah, basically those pro those steps, there's not that many steps, but it's important to hit off on all of them. Um, yeah, so basically what benefits can you see? Well, I hope that these benefits that I've listed here should be um, evident in the story that I've told so far about the, the tech squads we run here. So really it, it's upskilling teachers, it's encouraging collaboration, reflection, discussion, it's all built into the process. Um, it really actually has produces, it produces concrete benefits like guidelines and lesson plans for using the new tool if it's recommended. Um, it also encourages a critical approach to potential innovation. So rather than, um, you know, just uh, having a look at one tool, giving it a go, it, it's a really critical approach that yes, this looks like it has potential, but, you know, does it really work for what we want? Does it really serve our needs for our students in our context? Like, is it really helping with language development? Um, it also then can provide your institution or your school with evidence-based recommendations. So this isn't um, a single teacher trying one thing in one, one lesson. It's multiple teachers trying with all kinds of different students, different kinds of lessons. Um, so basically what this means is that the um, recommendations that you get out of Tech Squad are really, they have really strong generalizability because it's multiple classes, multiple kinds of students that you're pooling together the, the data. And so if you make a claim about whether a tool is um, beneficial or not, then it's really based on um, quite a lot of evidence, um, some really varied and solid evidence. 
So it, it's, it complements other kinds of processes like action research, which can be very in-depth and much longer process and can provide really great evidence. But um, this uh, provides a different kind of more broad base, much more varied data. Um, and basically, finally, it really empowers teachers to participate in the way the technology is shaping education by really getting them in that first step towards the kind of lofty goal that Lorillard um, uh, mentioned in, in the quote at the beginning. So basically, we're starting to get teachers really at the forefront so that um, they, they are the ones trialing the tools. They're the ones um, sharing how to use it, how to best use it, how to finding out how to do that. Um, and really, then they're much more strongly positioned to share what kind of technology they might want. Yeah, so really Tech Squad um, has a lot of benefits and it basically um, really complements a lot of other ways that we can support the development of blended learning, you know. So you've got um, action research, which can be really great, but it's quite a different, different much more involved um, process with a, usually with a single or a pair of um, teachers involved. It complements traditional PD because um, it's, uh, again, it doesn't replace the need for any of those things. And also, it, you know, it also complements um, your, if say you, you do have something like a central e-learning team who are investigating tools and piloting tools and, and introducing tools, it's another source of recommendations and evidence that really works together with those um, other types of processes around um, driving blended learning forward. But it really gives teachers um, a way to contribute. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that's really where I've, I'm going to stop with my um, explanations. So uh, I might open up to some questions for the last bit of time here. Um, yeah. So maybe my, I've got a question for you as well. So, you know, if you'd like to type in the chat, um, whether you think that uh, Tech Squad, how applicable this approach might be to your context. And also maybe if you'd like to share some ways that um, teachers at your context trial technology, you might do something quite similar. It's really interesting to hear some of those things. But also, um, actually, I think I can uh, jump ahead to some questions that I just mentioned. Yep. So if you want to share any of those in the chat, but also if you just want to ask any questions around Tech Squad and our experience, um, yeah. Yeah, so Sophie, do we have any um, any comments or questions so far? Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think there definitely are some questions. Um, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll just wait for Sophie maybe to uh, mention some of them. She did say there were a few, but in the meantime, yeah, I'd just like to thank you for a for a wonderful presentation. That was that was really good. And um, <clears throat> what I really like about Tech Squad and and that sort of PD model is the. Um, I guess the democratization of PD, you know, putting it into the teacher's hand. We always talk about, you know, giving our students autonomy. Um, but what I really like about that is you know, we're giving our teachers autonomy and we're sort of empowering them with, with their own PD, um, which is really, really nice to see. And I think it's definitely a, 
a model that you can um, employ in various different contexts, doesn't matter how big your school is. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, I see. Oh, okay, great. Sorry, my mic had dropped out, but I'm back now. Um, okay. So there definitely are some questions for you. Um, just getting them up and then I'll relay them. Okay, so somebody asked um, if there was a set of questions or issues that all teachers used when evaluating the tools or did one develop as a result? Oh, that's a good question. Well, actually the um, questions for investigation, that's really what emerges out of the um, kickoff meeting. So, um, Part of the facilitation there is really asking those questions and concerns, um, but they really become the criteria. So for example, with the VR, um, we were thinking about, well, what's the advantage for engagement? And do they do students feel a benefit for their English language development? So those questions that we um, brainstormed at the beginning, uh, I took photos of these boards and shared them in our folder. And um, then we circled back to them in the meeting at the end. So, we don't really have a checklist, um, but basically the questions for investigation and therefore the criteria for whether you're going to recommend the tool or not, uh, kind of they emerge organically out of the discussions that we have and the questions the teachers have. And also then um, really it's based on a lot of the data, you know, the student feedback forms and so on. Yeah. So I, okay, I hope that answers sure. the question. Yeah. yeah, I think it definitely did. Um, someone else has asked if you have a wish list of technologies that would be good to try out in TechSquad. Yes, well, this is this is an interesting one. Um, so basically, because the first one was definitely something that I um, set up, I kind of mentioned it a bit like it's a it's a book group, and I you know if I organize it, I've got to come up with the first book. So really, um, what we've done at Monash College is look around at, um, so per, as, as an e-learning uh, coordinator, I was always looking around at what tools I've seen around the world. So I would collect, so I had my own personal collection of, of uh, options. Um, and uh, then also teachers were invited to share different ones. So we had uh, one teacher, for example, mentioned uh, DuckDuckGoose. Um, which actually was trialed at Monash College, but in, not in, not within TechSquad, but within a different way. So we can actually trial it in TechSquad. It was uh, a different kind of project that was run in a slightly different program. So yeah, I think this is I think this is probably one of the challenges in terms of um, the kind of tool that fits the bill for TechSquad. But really, where you might start is have a look at tools that are very popular in other places. Um, for example, like I've seen a lot of stuff about Flipgrid, and this is why um, I recommended this as, a, as an option. It's always been, for me anyway, it's always been, this is something we could try, what, how does it sound? Um, and if teachers didn't like the idea or they had a different suggestion, uh, we would switch it out. But basically, that was I was fairly confident that would get a recommendation, but you never know for sure. Just, just because it's very popular elsewhere doesn't mean that it's going to work in your context. So that could be a good place to start, is to look at some tools that are very popular or you've seen even in other schools or colleges. Um, in mainstream education can be a good place to look for ideas, and that can be something to try. For, I mean, for example, Doctopus, actually, that's very popular in many contexts, but they really didn't like it at Monash College, so it really didn't fit our needs. So, um, yeah, there's no, we do have a, a, like a list, but it's basically a list that I've, I've got um, that I was collecting because um, I've mostly been facilitating, or we did have one that was facilitated by teachers as well. But yeah, that would be uh, some recommendations about how maybe to start collecting a list. Okay, great. Um, and someone else has asked if you've tested apps for phones. Apps for phones? Mm. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so actually um, VR is an app. The way that you access VR is through apps. So because we were using um, smartphones that you, you slide the student's smartphone into the VR viewer and you launch a particular app. So we, the way we tried VR was through a variety of different VR apps. So one, for example, was called Within. Uh, which is basically like a library of curated uh, 360 video content with some good stuff in there. We also just use YouTube 
Um, so in that sense, yes, we have trialed apps. Whereas, say, um, Flipgrid actually um, is browser-based. So um, yeah, there's absolutely no reason. You know, we have tried apps, but I can. For me, there's not really a big difference if it's phone apps, if it's a browser-based app, because. At Monash College, we have a BYOD policy, bring your own device policy. So all students have a laptop, but you might only have smartphones in your context. No problem from my point. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks so much for uh, building those questions. Um, yeah, like I said, once again, um, I think that's a wonderful uh, example of a community in practice, a uh, community of practice. And I think uh, just for a bit of a shame, there's one that you can also find that on uh, the English Australian EdTech SIG uh, Facebook page. If you have any further questions, we'll keep the conversation going. We'll post the recording up there as well as the time. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. It was a pleasure to share about Tech Squad today. Also, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me via email or Twitter. Um, and if you do trial a decide to try Tech Squad, I'd love to hear how it goes. So please do get in touch. So yeah, thanks very much, Hannah, Sophie, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>